Hey, I think it's about time. So uh, uh, welcome to the last lecture of this course, uh, lecture uh, 23 for noise robust uh, quantum machine learning. So uh, first of all, congratulations for uh, getting this place because it's the last lecture. So after this, uh, we finish the learning of this course. And next our lectures will be on uh, final project presentation. So before the lecture, I would like to first uh, talk about the logistics. So today's scrap duties will be due next Thursday um, at midnight. And also another important thing is about the final project. Okay, so, um, so the oral presentation will be on next Tuesday and Thursday. So it's about 10 minutes per group. Um, the team will introduce the background motivation method and result of the project, uh, which uh, is expected to last for eight minutes. And then the team will answer the questions from the audience, uh, which lasts for two minutes. Uh, and the third thing is about the demo video. So demo video is uh, strongly uh, recommended. So, so if you are doing some cool projects, is you can re record a video and to show that to the audience uh, during the presentation. Um, so the last thing is uh, please send me the slides on Canvas by next Monday uh, midnight. So. Uh, for the uh, written report that will be due on December uh, 13, midnight, and all the submissions must be in PDF, uh, four pages. So here we uh, show a link for the NeurX template. So um, you are encouraged uh, or required to uh, use this uh, format to, uh, to write the uh, report. Okay, any questions on the final project? Okay, cool. So uh, let's get started. Um, yeah, so today I uh, will introduce many uh, three aspects. First is the continue the towards quantum usage and examples. Uh, another is introduce uh, continue our previous uh, last lectures uh, parameterized quantum circuit uh, on the architecture search uh, and partner training, but our focus is how to make them uh, more noise robust. So the fir first section is on the towards quantum uh, continued. So uh, last time we introduced the, uh, the big picture of how to use the uh, TQ to construct the circuit, which is uh, very similar to the construction of uh, normal uh, neural networks. So uh, here we can see some uh, basic element or basic operations of the TQ uh, for the simulation of the quantum circuit. So actually, uh, uh, torch quantum is not only uh, uh, used for the construction of quantum neural nets, but you can do, uh, use the TQ to do any simulation of any quantum circuit. So in order to do that, um, so first of all, uh, to perform the uh, matrix uh, vector, which is state, state vector simulation, which uh, we introduced in the lecture uh, 21. So basically uh, we need to do some uh, vector matrix modification to simulate the state vector uh, of the, the current quantum system. So in that case, we can use this uh, QDAD, which is TQ.quantum device, and specify how many qubits we need to use. Um, and there are two ways to apply the quantum gates. The first way is that we can uh, import the TQ as the Q TQF, and then we can directly apply. Uh, remember that the H gate is Hadamard gate, which can create uh, the uh, superposition between the zero and one. So another way to uh, uh, apply this gate is that uh, we can use this uh, TQ.H. So that is very close to uh, uh, initialization, uh, in instantiation of uh, uh, um, deep learning model. So here we can just use this H gate, and then uh, the second line here is actually doing the forward uh, function of that uh, gate. So, um, so another uh, thing about the uh, here we can see uh, more examples like uh, like uh, another state or another class we can use to construct the quantum state is called TQ dot quantum state. So the difference between the quantum device is that the uh, quantum state can support uh, more syntax. So for example, we can directly use this Q state dot H. So that means you are applying H gate uh, to this quantum state and you can specify the, uh, the qubits and also the parameters uh, for, that, uh, for that state. So um, in, uh, in order to understand what happens uh, underneath the, uh, the, the interface here, we show the basic uh, data structures to uh, store the the state vectors and also the, the gates. So here we can see uh, for the for the state vector inside each uh, the quantum device or the quantum uh, quantum state, we can use this torch uh, dot zeros and then uh, the length of the uh, state will be two to the power of n. 
uh, recall that in the in the first uh, 20, 21st lecture, we show that the, the length of the set vector will be two to the power of n, right? So, uh, and then we um, we set the first uh, entry of the uh, state to be one plus zero state, which means uh, we are on all zero state. So that's how we initialize the quantum state. And for the C naught state, which we um, mentioned a lot of times, the C naught state are actually uh, doing this matrix. So we can directly use the torch dot tensor right, to uh, create this matrix. And then when we do the uh, matrix modification uh, with the state vector, we can just use the uh, modification between two tensors, which are native operations uh, in the PyTorch. So uh, another thing uh, that is uh, inherent to the PyTorch framework is that uh, we can get some in intermediate results uh, from the uh, dynamic computation block. So for example, here, uh, if we walk, uh, uh, initialize a quantum state, and then we apply some gates to the quantum state, um, and then we actually can obtain the in, uh, intermediate state. For example, we can print the Q state in the middle. So in that case, it's very uh, useful for the debugging. Say you want to uh, see what is the intermediate state uh, after you apply several layers of the quantum neural nets, and then you can just print the intermediate results. So that is pretty different to several other frameworks like the Google uh, quantum, uh, Google search. Uh, Google Quantum AI's uh, team's uh, product or the, the penny lines, penny lines. So basically, you cannot uh, get any uh, interpretable results from those frameworks. So another thing is the, the batch mode tensorized uh, processing. So basically, when you want to uh, process multiple uh, images uh, as the input to the quantum neural net, you want to have a feature which uh, enables the, the batch mode processing. So here we can just specify the batch size. So in that case, all the uh, all the computation will Computations will be uh, tensorized. So uh, we also have the GPU support, so it's pretty uh, easy to use. We just uh, specify the Q state uh, to torch device CUDA. So in that case, all the computations of the quantum neural nets in the model will be uh, processed on the GPU. So another thing is that uh, is the automatic gradient computation support. So uh, imagine that you want to uh, train the, 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 the parameters in the quantum neural nets you want to uh, get uh, perform the back propagation of the gradients, right? So uh, in that case, we can say uh, we have a quantum state, and then we have a target quantum state, which probably, uh, for example, we want to do classification. So that's just a, a one state on state one for uh, one entry here. Uh, so in that case, we can compute the loss, and then we can directly back prop uh, the loss function with this with this uh, loss dot back backward. So that's pretty the same syntax of the, the PyTorch framework. Okay, so um, so here is the encoder uh, encoding the classical data to the quantum. So we have various encoder support. So um, basically here uh, we have this, uh, we show this uh, encoder with different occasion case. So we can directly use the TQ uh, face encoder or some other encoders you want to construct to encode the classical data to the quantum domain. Um, so finally, we also have this uh, conversions to other frameworks. So say uh, when you construct a model in the in the torch uh, in the torch quantum framework, you want to convert that to the Cascade. So uh, for example, the IBM Cascade, you want to, because you want to deploy on a real device, so you have to use their interface or framework so that we can uh, use a lot of different um, converters in the uh, in the TQ. For example, here we can. Um, this is the, the quantum model we construct in the TQ, and then we can use the TQ to kiss it to construct uh, a certain quantum circuit class in the uh, kiss framework, and then that will be all uh, that can be deployed on real quantum device. So actually, um, the IBM uh, quantum uh, team they are they have open access to uh, all the quantum, uh, not all the quantum machines, but quantum machine with around like seven qubits. So uh, you can just uh, very conveniently to create a, a account, and then you can just play with the, the real device. Um, with no cost, so that's free access. Okay, so uh, here we can have a look at the speed up over other frameworks. So uh, let me ask, let me ask why we should use this uh, uh, TQ framework. So the, one of the uh, reason is the fast speed, speed of the framework uh, over other frameworks. So here we can see on the x axis that's the qubit number, and y axis is the runtime. So when the number of qubits increase. So we can see the, the runtime of the penny lane, which is another uh, baseline, is actually increased exponentially, but uh, increased in a pretty high uh, pace. But in the 
uh, orange, which is the TQ, we can see that uh, there is around uh, four times five x five times uh, speed up uh, when we have a large number of qubits, and also when we have this um, different uh, number of gates. So basically, we specify how many layers of the circuit in the uh, how many layers of the gates in the circuit. So we can see uh, when we have uh, many layers of the gates, uh, the speed up of the TQ is also significant. So uh, finally, we also have the uh, speed comparison in terms of the batch size. So uh, remember that we have the batch size support, so we, we can specify how many images we want to process uh, simultaneously. So you can see when we increase the batch size, uh, the time for the, the TQ running on GPU is actually uh, pretty uh, constant. But for the penny line, because the, uh, the basically it doesn't support the tensorized computation, so that's just a for loop. So we can see a linear increase of the runtime. Uh, when we run on the penny lane framework. Okay, so that's uh, some basic uses of TQ frameworks. So actually, uh, you can, uh, if you're interested, you can further check out the, uh, the, the documents and also examples on the web page. So here we come to the section two of the, uh, this lecture, which is the robust uh, quantum circuit architecture search. So in the previous uh, lectures, uh, we already, like in the several lectures ago, we already introduced the, uh, uh, the neuroarchitecture neuro -architect research uh, concept, uh, for example, the, the one for network, uh, the process NAS. So here um, we also have a similar problem in the, in the quantum uh, neural nets. So that's how can we design the architecture for the quantum circuit, uh, especially for the parameterized quantum circuit, uh, right? So here we can we can have a, a recap of the previous introduced PQC. So for the PQC, we have the fixed state. In the in the gray and also the yellow uh, yellow parameterized case uh, in the in the yellow color, so we can see that the, those two kinds of case and uh, the PQCs are also commonly used in the hybrid classical quantum models uh, like the ones we introduced ago, like the VQE uh, quantum neural nets and QLA algorithm. So um, here we show a pretty um, uh, intuitive. Uh, graph to see the, the impact of the noise because this our goal is to uh, give an intuition <coughs> of the uh, detrimental impact of the quantum noise on the on accuracy. So here we can see uh, the x axis is the number of factors in the circuit and the y axis is the uh, uh, accuracy of the at least four classification on the real device. So um, uh, in the in the green curve we can see the noise free simulation that means we just Run the simulation on the classical machine with with no uh, with no noise impact, and we can see that the accuracy uh, goes up when we have more parameters because the learning capacity of the model increase. Uh, however, when we deploy the same circuits on the real device, like the IBM Q Yorka machine, which is uh, a five qubits a real device, and we can see the accuracy. Uh, first of all, the accuracy goes up because the the capacity learning capacity of the model uh, goes up. But after that, we can see a pretty se severe drop after we, uh, when we increase the number of parameters. So it's not because of overfitting, because we can see on the uh, noise free scenario, the accuracy is just uh, saturated. If there is no accuracy drop, but because of the uh, more noise when we introduce more parameters, those parameters are in the uh, more gates, right? So more gates introduce more errors. So there, there is a trade off. So say you have many parameters, many gates. The learning capacity is large. That means uh, in the noise free scenario, the accuracy is high. But the more gates also introduce more errors. So there is a sweet spot here that the, uh, here is the best trade off. So we, we can have a balance between the, the better learning capacity and the uh, smaller noise. So uh, the goal of this, uh, the first, uh, the section two here is to try to find what is the best uh, architecture that lie, uh, lie on this, this sweet spot. Which we have uh, the highest uh, highest accuracy on the real device. So, uh, however, it's not a very uh, very very easy task because of the large design space. Right. So uh, we can see there are at least three uh, different settings, like different kinds of gates. We can use the U3 gates, C3 gates, uh, or we can use the, the X gates, CZ gates, or other uh, different kinds of gates. So that's the first uh, uh, first setting of the design space. We have many different types of gates. Uh, and, and also, of course, we have uh, different numbers of gates, right? So say for this uh, U3 and U3 uh, design uh, design space, we can use just one layer of the gates uh, 
uh, or we can just uh, we can contain it multiple layers of the circuit. So that's just similar to the uh, to the uh, traditional neural net search. You, you have you have one layer of convolution, but you can also contain that for many layers. And what what kind of type of uh, operation you want to use is uh, either the uh, the one D depth wise uh, one D com or um, the depth wise com or the uh, the point wise com or some other uh, different uh, group, group convolutions. So different operations uh, is uh, analogs analogous to this different type of case. Um, the third thing is that the position of the case is also uh, different, also have a large space. So say uh, we have the same uh, type of case, we just use a U3 and CU3, and we just have uh, eight case, but the, the locations of the case can also be uh, different. So on the left hand side, we can just um, like in a pretty normal way, we have one 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 layer of U3 and then one layer of CU3. But also we can um, shuffle the, the positions of the case, right? We can shuffle them. We can shuffle them to uh, here uh, some some CU3 case and then U3 case, CU3, U3 case. So actually, there's a huge design space. And how can we uh, explore this large large design space, right? So go uh, here. We introduce uh, one of the framework uh, along. With several others. So, first one is the quantum NAS framework. So, actually, the goal of this uh, framework is to automatically and also efficiently search for the best architecture, right? So, on the left hand side, the automatic and efficient search is achieved by, achieved by the super circuit, which provides the parameters to many sub circuits. And on the right hand side, we have the noise robust quantum circuit. So, how, how can we achieve that? So, the, the main, main idea is that when, when you search for the architecture, you can uh, involve the real device in a search loop. So say uh, I have several candidates and then I can test what is the noise robustness of each one, right? And then we can um, select the best uh, or the most robust one. And also another thing is that uh, we, we, do, we do the co-search of the circuit architecture and the qubit mapping. So remember the qubit mapping we uh, introduced last time, that is the, the logical qubits and physical qubits, how, how you can uh, map between those uh, qubits, right? So that's also a design space. So we can do the co-search of the architecture space and the mapping space here to uh, to to con um, to uh, solve this uh, noise robustness uh, issue. Okay. So there are basically four steps in the quantum NAS framework. So the first step is the super circuit uh, construction and training, and second step is uh, how can we do the search of the uh, sub circuit and the mapping, and the third step is the training of the search sub circuit. So the final step, the final step is iterative uh, quantum gate learning. So here, uh, let's have a look at a, a simple example of the uh, what is a super circuit and sub circuit. So remember that in the previous uh, lecture we introduced supernet and subnet. So just uh, use the similar philosophy here. Where we can construct a super circuit. So here is a uh, the super circuit here contains it's actually the the largest circuit or which uh, contains the most the most number of gates in the design space. So here, uh, assume we have this uh, U3 plus CU3 uh, space, and then the largest super circuit contains all the eight gates, possible gates in the design space. And for the sub circuit, uh, the sub circuit is defined as the uh, uh, one of the candidates in the, in the search space. So for example, here we show uh, three different sub circuit. The first one just contains the, the number two, number three, five, six, and eight gates. And other several ones contain different gates in the, in the design space. So those are the sub circuit uh, from the same design space. So um, here you may ask why we we use the super circuit and sub circuit framework. So the most intuitive way is that say I want to search for architecture, right? I have those like say 100 candidates. I just need to test each of them and then check the pick the best one. But the problem is that remember. Uh, when, when we when we have a parameterized common circuit, we have to do the training. So say we have 100, uh, 100 candidates, we need to do the training for 100 times. And then after training parameters, we can do the deployment on the real device to, to check the robustness. So that's a two, two level loop, right? So on the, on the, on the outer level here, uh, we actually, it's a PQC, uh, right? And in the inner loop, that's the uh, training, training steps. So if we have 100 circuit, each of them we need to train like several hundred several hundred steps. 
that's an extremely large uh, training cost we need to take. And, and uh, let alone even larger space with like several thousands of candidates. So it's impossible to train each of them. So the idea here is that how can we uh, move this uh, portal? The, the training is done with outside, right? So we just need to do the training for once, but we can uh, still uh, search inside this large uh, design space. So that's why we are constructing a super circuit and train the parameters in a super circuit. We want to just train once and then all the candidates we can share parameters in a super circuit, right? So uh, the goal of the super circuit is that to enable the efficient search of the architecture candidates without uh, train each uh, sub, sub circuit. So the parameters of the sub circuit is inherited from the super circuit. And with this inherited parameter, we can find some good, uh, good sub circuits. So our hope is that with this inherited parameters, the best circuit is also the circuit that we train from scratch. So later on, we'll show there, that there is a pretty, um, a pretty positive correlation between the using the parameters, inherited parameters or use parameters trained from scratch. Okay, so uh, here comes the, uh, the training step of the super circuit. So uh, in one super circuit training step, we actually want to do a sampling and updating uh, iteratively. So the sampling means uh, we want to sample a gate subset from the, the super circuit, which is a sub circuit. And then we can do the uh, training. So here actually we have two uh, specific techniques to do the sampling we will introduce later, which is called uh, front sampling and restricted sampling. So actually we, we can only, we only use in one step, that's the one step of training. So we only use this sub circuit to, to do the inference of the task. Say we do the quantum neuronized inference to classify, uh, classify uh, uh, an input image, and then we can update the parameters just inside this subset and freeze other parameters. If we're not, not using other parameters, we don't, uh, do, don't do anything to them. Um, and then we can uh, do the parameter updates uh, across multiple states. So basically the, the updates are cumulative across multiple steps. Um, so here we can have a look at an animation for this uh, whole process. So basically in each step uh, for the uh, for the solid uh, blocks, those are the gates that we sampled from the super circuit. And for other transparent blocks, those are, we just free, freeze the parameters, right? So we can see each step, uh, we can sample a sub circuit from the design space and then update the parameters in the, uh, in the uh, gates. And after many steps, uh, we actually can obtain uh, a trained super, uh, super circuit. So during super circuit sampling, uh, you may uh, have already noticed that the, the, the sampling is not purely random. So actually we apply two uh, sampling techniques to uh, make sure that the training process is stable enough. The first one is called uh, front sampling. So for example, if we decide to just, um, to decide to just sample two gates in the first layer. So what happens here, we just sample the gate one and gate two instead of sample two random gates. So we always keep the front, uh, front qubits mostly used, right? And also that's all the case for the second layer. So if we uh, sample two gates, we just sample the first one and second one. And if we just sample one gate, that must be the first gate, and sample three gates, that's gate one, two, three, right? So that's the front sampling. And also we have the, another thing is called uh, restricted sampling. So restricted sampling is, uh, uh, easier to understand. So just uh, when, we, when you sample two consecutive steps, and if you see, say uh, in the first step here, uh, I sample the case, uh, the architecture is, looks, like, looks like this. And then in the next step, if I sample another circuit uh, in this architecture, and then I check what is the, the number of layers that is different between those two uh, circuit architecture. And if um, I have a restriction on at most four different layers can be different. So in that case, uh, if five layers are different, I just reject this uh, step and I can do a resample of the another uh, circuit here. So the intuition is that uh, during uh, uh, beside, uh, between two consecutive steps, I want to make sure that circuit architecture is, uh, is uh, not that drastically different. Otherwise the training, it will not be uh, very stable. Right. So next step, I, I sample another one, and I found that there are, there are only two layers different, and I accept this to, to uh, continue the training. Okay. So um, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. 
Um, okay, so uh, here I show another example for the uh, training process I just mentioned. So basically, uh, in the first step here, uh, if I sample the first two blocks, the like first two gates here, uh, which are the 0 0.1, 0 0.2, I will only update those parameters. So say second step, I sample three ones, so I just update them. The next step, I freeze others because in the white, uh, white font here, white color here means the parameters are freeze. And for this one, I just uh, use uh, only update the first one, the first gate, right? Okay, so here uh, comes to an important, uh, the important assumption, which is that uh, when we use the inherent factors from the super circuit, whether the performance of the uh, sub circuit is the uh, is, is reliable enough to say, um, <clears throat> for example, here the x axis is that uh, using the sub circuit uh, with the inherent factors. So after we train the super circuit, the super circuit, we use the inherent factors from the super circuit to evaluate. Uh, a bunch of uh, sub circuit and the y axis is performance that I train the super uh, train the parameters of each sub circuit from scratch. So that is the most uh, accurate one, right? Because there is no parameter sharing, there's no approximation here. I just uh, train them uh, individually. So the y axis is individual performance, and x axis is the uh, performance using the integrity parameters. So we can have a look at each one. So uh, we com com uh, compute the Spearman's uh, correlation score, right? So we can see that there is a pretty, pretty high uh, positive correlation. So that means with this uh, inherent parameter is enough for us to uh, to get, uh, to find the best circuit. Because our goal is just to find the best architecture, right? So it, it's enough to get the order preserving property between the approximate performance and real performance. So because of the high correlation score here, we can confidently say that uh, using the inherent parameters is uh, accurate enough. Okay, so um, that's the first step of the training super circuit. So the next step will be, how can we do the search of the uh, sub circuit? Because our ultimate goal is to uh, find the best architecture, right? So the search process is that uh, we actually do a co-search of the uh, sub circuit and this qubit mapping. So uh, remember that uh, qubit mapping is the process to map the logical qubits to the physical ones. So here we show the uh, coupling map of the IBM Q uh, Yorktown machine. So basically we have five qubits and they have a, a cross plus two, two uh, connections. So it's not also a connection, right? So when we, uh, when we uh, map this uh, logical qubits to the physical ones, we just use different colors here to represent the physical qubits that will be uh, used to, to execute that qubits. So we can actually have uh, many different uh, candidates. So besides uh, beside the different architecture of the circuit, we can also have different uh, logical to physical qubit mappings. Right? So our goal is to, uh, to do the search of the qubit mapping pair together with the architecture of the sub-circuit. So, uh, in the so in that case, we can actually uh, leverage any uh, available search engine, it's either uh, evolutionary search or the Bayesian optimization or random search, even uh, or reinforced learning. So anything you can uh, actually apply the search uh, process, uh, search engine to do the search in the design space because the search, um, the sub circuit performance can be estimated with the super circuit. So that process is already pretty uh, efficient. So we can just uh, uh, select a uh, uh, engine such as evolutionary search engine to search for the sub circuit, right? So, um, not sure if you are familiar with the uh, evolution. So, any any of you used the uh, evolution search uh, previously? <laughs> no, the yeah, evolution is that so, say uh, you have a, a gene to represent the, the setting of the current uh, candidates. So, for example, we can use uh, some, some members, settings of the architecture, and also the logical to physical mapping. To, to represent what is the current setting. So our goal is just to update the, the, the setting vector, right, to, to, to get the best performance. So uh, the evolution search engine actually have two, uh, two uh, critical steps to generate a new population. So the mutation and crossover. So we'll introduce those two uh, later. So basically uh, in one search iteration, we just have a lot of uh, sub circuit and mapping pairs. And then uh, we use the parameters like, right from the super circuit, we use the parameters from super circuit instead of training each of them, and then we can we can evaluate 
the performance of the subcircuit actually might impair on the real quantum device. In that case, the performance will be uh, noise impacted instead of just a noise free uh, uh, performance. So we can feedback this performance to engine and then we generate the next, um, next population. So here we can see uh, what is the, the mutation and cause over mean. So remember that we need to use a gene to represent the current, current architecture. So uh, here I show a very simple example like we just use the number to represent how many phase inside each layer. Like a two, three, four, two, means that we have two gates in the first layer, three gates in the second, four in the third, and two in the last layer. And actually the mutation means that uh, I just randomly choose some of the, the genes here and then change the number here. That means like the, the three here means that I mutate the first gates, the first layer of architecture from two to three, and two here again, I mutate from two to three. And also another thing is crossover. So crossover is that when you generate a new uh, candidate, a new candidate a gene, I can uh, select two uh, parents, uh, like the the uh, the white one and also the the, the black, not black, maybe uh, green, <laughs> the green one. So in that case, um, I can just uh, randomly choose uh, some uh, sub genes from two parents and then uh, create a new candidate with the gene uh, composed gene, right? So in that case, uh, that's the crossover. So uh, using those two methods, we, we can generate a new population. So that's the uh, how the basically the evolution of the search engine work, not, not just for the uh, quantum mass framework, but also uh, widely applicable to all the other uh, optimization problems. So uh, yeah, so after we uh, using the, the, the search, uh, search uh, uh, step, we actually can run many iterations. And the last iteration will generate uh, the most noise robust circuit architecture. So we can directly use the architecture to do any uh, downstream task. For example, we want to train that for, for quantum neural nets, we can just train that from scratch, right? So uh, actually during the training, we can do a, uh, another step of the optimization, so which is the pruning. So this step is actually orthogonal to the, the previous three steps. You can use this um, just as a standalone technique. So the, the idea is here is that Say I already uh, finished the search, which I found that um, this architecture is the best one. So maybe we have n blocks n equals to four, and then I, I already searched this sub circuit architecture. And during the training of the parameters, uh, I can do some fine grained uh, pruning of the gates. So the reason why is that the reason why we can do the pruning is that so say we have a rotation gates, rotation x. Uh, if the rotation x with zero zero as the rotation angle. So that is the same as the identity, identity gate, right? Identity gate doesn't, doesn't have any impact on the final performance or final accuracy or the final uh, result. So in that case, we can just remove those uh, gates with angles very close to zero and then do the fine tuning of the remaining gates. So say I find that the zero gate is safe and then I can just remove that. After remove this case, there is no operation when we apply this gate. So I just remove that. So in that case, we don't need to introduce the error or the quantum noise corresponding to that gate. So we, so we can say, uh, we can keep the learning capacity, but we can reduce the impact of the noise. So that's why the, the pruning can, uh, can even improve accuracy on real device. So we remember in the, in the uh, first, uh, first several lectures, we introduced the pruning technique, but typically after you do the pruning, we just hope that accuracy is not dropped, right? But here in the quantum circuit on real device, accuracy can even increase because there is another factor is the, uh, the impact of noise. If you reduce that and the, the noise free accuracy is the same, you can actually increase accuracy, accuracy a little bit. So we will show the result later. Um, so after several steps, we can do the pruning and fine tuning of the remaining parameters and then pruning. So uh, we finally just have a, a smaller number of gates in the, in the, in the, uh, in the architecture space uh, in the sub circuit research. Okay, so uh, here we come to the evaluation for the uh, this quantum mass framework. We used uh, some quantum machine learning classification task that at least uh, 10 classification, uh, four classification, two classification, and also the five at least, and, uh, as well as the uh, ball classification task. So also we have the uh, BQE task. Uh, BQE is for the finding the smallest eigenvalue for the uh, given matrix. So the matrix are the Hamiltonian matrices of the uh, hydrogen uh, water. Um, 
uh, uh, such for several uh, different molecules. And also we use the, again, use the IBM uh, device. So qubits is ranked from five to uh, 65 with a uh, quantum volume uh, up to 128. So uh, again, the architecture we are using is the quantum neural nets. So we have the encoder trainable layers measurement and also the EQE here, we just have the training layers and also the measurement to get the, to minimize the measurement outcomes. So uh, here we show a curve for uh, several important baselines. So because we are saying that noise adaptive search is best, so how can we prove that, right? So we just uh, remove the noise awareness, which is the noise unaware search. And another thing is that why we need to do the search, why human hand design is not, not good enough. Right, so so we compare the quantum mass search uh, results with the noise unaware search in the in the yellow, and also the uh, quantum mass is in the in the right curve, um, and the human design is in blue curve. So the y-axis is the accuracy of the uh, at least four times taken on the real device. So we can see uh, when when the number of uh, parameters or number of case increased, so the accuracy of the uh, quantum mass is actually uh, all, all of the models is first increased then decrease because of the trade-off between the noise and learning capacity, right? Actually, the quantum mass can delay this peak. So for example, we can delay that about 40 parameters to around 50 parameters. So the, the learning capacity can be larger so we can tolerate uh, more quantum noise. So in that case, the accuracy can also be uh, improved. So here we show the uh, another thing is the uh, optimization of the uh, hydrogen molecule uh, BQE task. So basically, uh, in this task, the, the, the value is lower the better because we want to uh, reduce, um, we want to find the smallest eigenvalue. So that's, of course, uh, lower the better. So the optimal solution is uh, minus 1.85 here. And then uh, we compare with uh, several uh, baselines. So uh, here we can see uh, the UCSD, UCSD baseline is a hardware efficient uh, architecture that is designed by, uh, that, by a physis physicist. And also we have the noise unaware search, uh, random search, random generation, random generated, and also the human design in the in the green and the quantum mass in red. So we can see for uh, diverse design space for this uh, hydrogen molecule, we can achieve the uh, lowest uh, estimated as the lowest the small lowest uh, eigenvalue for the given uh, matrix, which is the hamiltonian of the hydrogen. Right. So that's consistent across different design spaces. And also, uh, we want to uh, see whether that can scale to a larger number of qubits. So we do some experiments on uh, even larger machines with uh, 15 qubits, 16, uh, even for the IBM Q Manhattan, which contains uh, 65 qubits, right? So we can see that, of course, uh, if you see the accuracy here for at least a 10 classification, you may, uh, you may feel uh, ridiculous because this accuracy is only 2%. Like ten percent is means you are doing random, random guess right? because we have ten class and the accuracy is ten percent. Right? So, but here we can see that uh, actually using the quantum mass, we can improve the accuracy by a little bit. So the I I, I would not say the final accuracy is very high, but compared with the uh, baselines, we do have a pretty large uh, improvements from the ten percent random guess to around thirty percent. And so, uh, first of all, that is because of the large noise. Another thing is that um, the uh, the search space can be handled uh, by the quantum mass to get a better solution. But I would say there's still, still a long way to go, uh, especially to how to solve this uh, noise impact. Because for this model, uh, on the real, uh, on the noise free scenario, the accuracy can be as high as 80%, but that the noise kicks in and which reduce another, like reduce 50% of accuracy. Okay, so uh, here we show what is the, uh, what is the improvements of the pruning. So remember that pruning can, uh, uh, in the classical neural nets, we would just hope pruning don't hurt the accuracy, right? But here, after doing the, the pruning, because the uh, noise-free pass is the same, roughly the same because of the retraining, and then after the pruning, we introduce a smaller impact of noise so that uh, we can see around 3% of the uh, improvements on accuracy. So uh, we also have a look at time cost. So remember that in the, in the baseline search, we need to do two for loop one for the architecture, another for for the training steps. So the training cost is extremely high, but with the uh, quantum mass framework, we can uh, further reduce the, the hours by around uh, three orders of magnitude uh, because of the 
and we just need to train once but to search for uh, all the candidates. So um, uh, remember that during the evolution search, we actually can uh, use the real device to, to give the feedback. But another thing is uh, we can uh, optimize is that we can train a neural net to do some prediction of the real device, uh, real uh, circuit performance on real device. So that's the idea behind this uh, graph transformer for uh, graph transformer for quantum circuit reliability estimation. So that the, so the whole idea is that on the on the on the target device, we can generate many pairs between the quantum circuit and also the final performance, right? And then after you generate many pairs, you can train a uh, deep learning model to to uh, to try to map to try to map the, the input circuit with the final performance. So that's how we did here. So basically we generate some random circuits and then uh, we concatenate the circuit with the inverse of the circuit. So what happens when we have this, say the, the unit tree here and then I apply the, the inverse of the unit tree. What happens after the, 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 the unit tree and inverse? The, re the result will be identity, right? Any matrix multiplied by the inverse is identity. So that means after, after, after the uh, component running this circuit and inverse circuit, uh, what is the input will be still output, will not be changed. So that we only leave the uh, left, uh, I mean, the, leave the, the impact of the noise. So that's say we have the all zero state. And then we do the measurement here. So all zero state will be in the, in the first place here. So the ideal case will be 100%, but because of the noise, we may only get 70% uh, in the all zero state. So in that case, we can estimate what, what is the, the magnitude of the noise right now using this method. So basically, uh, remember, uh, recall that we uh, we have the graph transformer, and the graph transformer basically uh, uh, process the circuit graph. So uh, here we have this input circuit uh, diagram, and then we can convert that to a uh, control and, and data dependency map, dependency graph, uh, which is represented here, like different nodes uh, with uh, different colors uh, that represent different gates, and also the input and all of the nodes. And then we can use uh, a graph transformer. Uh, actually, you can use uh, any different graph neural nets you, uh, you want to use. But uh, uh, we find that graph transformer is the actually uh, performance best. So we, we basically uh, use this graph transformer to process the information on different layers. Um, and then we have the GPD matrices here to uh, generate uh, the attention score between the, the center node and all the neighboring nodes. And finally, we use some regressor layer to regress what is the final uh, predicted fidelity. And there are also other words like this neural predictor based quantum architecture search. So they also try to uh, generate the performance of the estimate performance of the circuit. But instead of using graph, they just uh, use the uh, image to represent the circuit, right? So how can, how can they do this? Basically, they have this, uh, say, three qubits, and then that's, that's this, that is represented by three lines of pixels. And then they have this uh, swap gate. They use two pixels to represent that swap gate. And then the ZZ gate is two pixels here. So that's very interesting uh, work. So basically, for all the other um, uh, blanks here, they just uh, deal with the identity case. So in that case, we can transfer this uh, quantum circuit to uh, to image with the pixels and method. So after this, uh, we can we can use any convolutional neural nets to rep to process the quantum circuit image representation to estimate the final performance. Um, besides using the uh, as I mentioned, I uh, in our quantum NAS framework we use the uh, use the evolutionary search. But actually, there are also other uh, works uh, using. Other uh, algorithms like reinforced learning. So, in this work, quantum market search via deep reinforced learning, they basically uh, use an R agent to generate the, uh, the action for each step. So say the R agent will generate, say, whether that will place a gate on which wire, and then uh, evaluate the circuit. Then that would be the reward uh, of that act action back to the R agent. So, that is the reinforced learning based method. And also, another is the um, the, the differentiable and the dots based, like in the differentiable architecture search, uh, basically the idea is uh, also um, similar to the to the dots, like in the in the deep learning architecture search. So we, we have a differentiable uh, searcher to generate uh, different operations. There is operation pool, and then they have a evaluation for the uh, generated circuit. So um, 
Another another uh, paper is called a quantum circuit search, ocular search for variational quantum algorithms. So the idea is also similar to the uh, to our previous work. So basically, they have this um, uh, search uh, supernet setup, and then the optimization is of server circuit. And then uh, instead of use a search engine, they just simply run all the candidates. So rank for the rank one circuit, they use that to train. But for the extremely large space, it's very difficult to uh, rank all the uh, all the circuits here. The last section of this law lecture is on the uh, robust uh, MRS quantum circuit training. So previously we introduced like for the art different architecture, we have different robustness. But then another uh, dimension that we can improve the robustness on, on the parameter, right? So here. Yeah, previous several works just focus on the architecture, but after we have the architecture during the training process, we can also apply some optimizations to make sure that parameters is more uh, adaptive to the noise on the real device. But how can we do that? So the first thing is that I want to introduce a, uh, a new concept, which is multi-node uh, QNN. So actually previously we had this, um, I remember if we are just up here, so we have a previous uh, diagram, right? So basically, we have this uh, input image uh, and this uh, one, and then we can encode to the to the uh, quantum state. And then we can do some uh, trainable quantum layers, and then do the measurement. So after the measurement, uh, the two uh, two lines here means the classical result. So after we do the measurement, we can do some encode encoding uh, back to again to the quantum domain if we want to do another node of the quantum circuit, right? So in order, in order to do that. We can either use uh, the same uh, like encoder, for example, rotation uh, angle encoder like RYs to encode those uh, measurement outcome, or we can also use some other encoders. But the idea is that we can do this uh, hybrid uh, iterative uh, way. So we have some uh, first uh, classical input uh, quantum layers and quant uh, classical input classical data, quantum data, classical data. So we can apply this many layers. And the trade off here is that. If we have an extremely large, so why we need to do this is not just one single layer, right? So the idea is that if we have extremely large number of gates inside one quantum layer, so because of the quantum noise, the final measurement outcome may be very uh, bad. So all the gates, uh, the, the error are accumulated, so the final result will be not uh, satisfactory. satisfactory. So um, in that case, we can satisfy some of satisfy some of the learning capacity. So we can do the measurement here, and then we can uh, apply some of the uh, uh, error mitigation for the result measured here. So after the uh, error mitigation, the result will be the error can be removed, and then we encode back and use another uh, several layers of quantum circuit to finish the, the next step of the computation. So that's a trade off. So the larger capacity larger noise but we can reduce capacity by doing measurement in between and then we can do the error mitigation to remove some noise and then we can do the uh, communication uh, continuous uh, in the next step so um, one of the uh, one way to uh, do the uh, error mitigation in between is that uh, we can use a method called post measurement normalization so uh, post measurement normalization means that say we have a we, we want to train a quantum neural, neural nets and batch size can be uh, 50 and there are four qubits. So after we do the measurement in between, that would be 50 by four values, right? Because we have 50 circuit and each circuit contains four qubits. We just do the measurement and then we have this uh, four, by, uh, four by 50 uh, matrix. So in that case, uh, we can do something very similar to a batch uh, normalization. So basically on the batch dimension, which is a 50, 50 dimension, we can compute, uh, say, what is the uh, mean and standard deviation right, for this uh, for the this batch of data. So here uh, I show that in the in the in yellow. Right? So we can compute the mean, and uh, this is uh, qubit one, qubit two, qubit three, qubit five, and this is the batch dimension. So we can compute the mean and standard deviation, standard deviation across this uh, domain, this dimension, and then we just uh, do the normalization of this. Um, this row of data using the mean and salivation computed from that. So that's a uh, batch dimension normalization. Uh, so, um, like I said, normalize the measurement outcome with the uh, computed mean and salivation. 
Um, so after this uh, normalization, what is the impact of the outcome? So we can have to look at the uh, some uh, visualization result uh, here. So uh, on the left hand side, we have uh, say I just I track the the result on pivot one. So uh, there are two different colors. One color is blue. That means the noise free simulation. So because we have like uh, fifty by uh, fifty uh, results, like uh, for the batch size fifty, so we can plot the uh, histogram for the cumulative one result uh, in the in the blue uh, blue here blue histogram. So that is a noise free simulation. But when we deploy that the same circuit on the real device, we can see that is in the yellow. So yellow here is here. So we can see that there is an extremely large uh, difference between the the noise free simulation and real device, right? So, and we compute the signal to noise ratio that is just a 0 0.89. So, uh, however, after we apply, um, uh, we apply this uh, normalization, we actually can uh, do some alignment between the blue and, and, and orange, uh, yellow curve here. So we can see uh, a large peak here, another large peak here. And, and roughly for the real device, we can uh, match the distribution of the uh, noise free simulation and, and real device. So because we do uh, the this difference between noise free simulation and, uh, and real and real device is reduced. So the final accuracy can also be improved. Right. So um yeah that's the first technique uh, post measurement normalization. So actually we also have a, a theoretical proof uh, for this uh, step. So uh, uh, you can check out the uh, the quantum NAT paper. So uh, later on, I'll show that uh, in the reference. So uh, basically, another technique uh, which is very intuitive is the noise injection. So um, if you know some of the adversarial attack in the classical deep neural nets, uh, so one one of the way to uh, alleviate the adversarial attack uh, phenomena is to add some uh, Gaussian noise to the input. So in that case, um, we also uh, inspired by a similar uh, similar uh, idea. We can also do the noise injection during the training of the quantum neural nets. So uh, the idea is that when, when we train the parameters on train the parameters on the uh, classical device, uh, we can insert some of the noise uh, from the real device noise model, so that on the classical noise-free scenario, the parameters will get familiar what is the noise looks like on the real device, right? And then when we do the real deployment. The the uh, distribution of the noise will be matched to the to what we uh, do that during the training, so the parameters can be uh, uh, can be more robust to the real device. So there are two uh, two uh, noise two errors that we want to, uh, uh, to inject during the training. So the first uh, first error is called poly error. Another is a readout error. So uh, we can start with readout errors. Readout readout error is that uh, say uh, we have a, a period in the in a one zero state. So when we do the one zero measurement, there should be 100% to measure a zero, right? Because the, this is a zero state. So we, we should uh, measure a possible zero here. But there is some chance that even the state is a 100% zero, we can still measure one off. So that's, uh, that's called a readout error. So that's also the case for zero one state, we can measure one, we can also measure zero. So there is a, a matrix. It's like a confusion matrix, right? So uh, in, that that tells you what is the percentage of uh, when we prepare zero and measure zero. So that is typically pretty high. Say we have like zero point nine percent of uh, measuring zero from zero, but we also have like small percentage uh, measuring one from zero because of the the imperfect, imperfect operations during the measurement. So again, uh, we also have, let's say, 0 0.95 to measure a uh, classical one out of uh, one, one. And but also we may have 0.05 uh, percentage of the uh, uh, probability to measure uh, incorrect zero out. So that is the readout error, readout error. Uh, error matrix. So in that case, we can, um, that is only, uh, uh, that only happens on the real device. So the idea is that during the training, we can also apply this error matrix right here. We can also apply this error matrix uh, during the classical noise-free training 
So in that, in that case, we can match the, the mathematical like uh, percentage of the, the error here uh, on the real device uh, inside uh, our Haskell training framework. Right? So that's how we inject this uh, readout error to the uh, training, training process. And another thing is called poly error. So the poly error is, uh, is more interesting. Actually, so poly error is that for all the quantum errors, we can, uh, we can have a model to say, uh, what is uh, to trans, uh, unify all the errors to the poly error? That means after uh, an operation, uh, there will be a percentage of the probability that there, there is an unwanted uh, error gate after the operation. So say, uh, I want to perform a user gate on real device, but uh, there is some chance, say uh, 0.96% of chance, the circuit is actually performing a U3 and then exiting. The X is not what we want, right? But there is a small percentage of the uh, probability that we actually perform that incorrectly. So uh, from the real common device, like the IBM device, we actually can retrieve uh, uh, the error uh, information from the uh, calibration team. So for example, here we can see uh, the X gate, the for this SX basic native gate, there is a percentage of uh, probability of 0 0.9, 0 0.096 uh, to have an additional X. And also, uh, there's also a case for some other gates like Y and E. And none means that the, actually the, the gate is uh, basically performed, which is uh, close to one. And again, we have this error, error uh, readout error matrix from the calibration data. So during this process, uh, we can do the training and uh, in, inject uh, different gates. So we can uh, sample from this uh, noise distribution. And then after we sample, sample out a gate. So most of the time, there's just a NAND gate, which is identity, right? But sometimes we sample out a white gate, and then we just uh, add that uh, after the uh, after this, uh, this U3 gate. So, um, and also for sample two, that's maybe another step, right? So we can uh, sample out another set of uh, error gates and inject after those uh, uh, those uh, original gates. So in that case, we can make sure that the uh, the, the training landscape is pretty similar to the real device, uh, uh, even on the classical simulator side. Um, another thing that is uh, pretty interesting is called a uh, post measurement quantization. So uh, for quantization, we already uh, learned that in the previous lectures, so basically you can uh, reduce the bit weights from the floating point to, to uh, integers, right? So uh, we can also apply that uh, post measurement quantization. So why there is always a post measurement? So because we, we can only perform those operations on the measurement, on the classical data, right? So on the quantum data, if you do any measurement or some other operation, that will, that will class. So we can only do the post measurement quantization. So basically, um, so here uh, on the right uh, top corner, we show an intuitive uh, uh, figure to see what is the uh, what is the process looks like. So basically, we have this uh, input uh, input uh, uh, value on those uh, uh, centroids, and then uh, because of the impact of the quantum error, there will be some small drift. So and then after the quantization, most of the result will be quantized back to the centroids. Right after back to centroids, a small Errors will be uh, will be removed, and then some of them will be magnified. But the, if we can control control the, the percentage of the uh, the error error centroids that we, that can be controlled through some uh, hyperbank search, and the only remaining uh, error is the quantization error because previously those can be in the middle, but after quantization, all of them will be in the centroids. So in that case, we again add some. Uh, uh, loss term to the to the measurement outcome, right? So say we encourage all the all the all the measurement outcome to be very near to the centroids. So if that's far away from the centroids, we just can uh, have a large uh, uh, we just penalize that through adding a very large uh, loss here. So say uh, on the centroids loss is zero, but on the uh, far away from centroids loss is very large. So in that case, we can encourage that all, uh, the quantization error to be uh, small, as small as possible. So in that, in that case, uh, we can both reduce the, uh, the, the error introduced by quantum noise and also the error introduced by the quantization. Uh, again, here we can show, uh, we can have a look at some, uh, this is the real uh, result on IBM machine. 
<clears throat> so on the left hand side, uh, the X is the bench dimension and the Y is the uh, qubit dimension. So we can see uh, again three qubits, zero, one, two, three. And uh, before the quantization, so um, we have the, we show the, the, uh, the error for each of the uh, values. So uh, we can see that the uh, mean square error is 0 0.235 and the signal noise ratio is just uh, four. But after quantization, we can see uh, most of the uh, results that there will be no uh, no error because of the quantization to the same place. And some of them uh, has, has a large quantization, uh, large error. But we can actually uh, control that error through uh, changing the, the quantization bitways. Um, uh, so but basically, after even with those uh, small errors, uh, we can still have a, a better signal noise ratio and uh, lower uh, mean square error after this quantization. Okay, so uh, for the evaluation of those three methods, we also change the uh, also choose the uh, quantum machine learning tasks, and also the uh, uh, we include amnes, uh, fashion amnes, and also we have a new uh, benchmark on the sidebar two uh, class. Uh, basically, uh, we evaluate uh, on the idea of quantum machines. So, uh, so here we can have a look at the uh, the results on uh, different uh, devices. So uh, basically, here is the uh, IBM uh, San Diego device. Um, so here we can have a look at the uh, several uh, base, uh, several benchmarks from the M4 uh, to the side of two. So the baseline is that uh, we don't do any um, any optimization. So we just uh, train the, the parameters on the task device and then that is on the uh, IBM San Diego device. So after the normalization, so say. Uh, we have the M4 here, so we, we can increase accuracy by like 10%. And after noise injection, there is a large uh, jump of the accuracy uh, all the way to 20% uh, of the improvements. And after the quantization, we can further uh, improve the accuracy to uh, around 70%. So that's also the case for the fashion and this uh, low classification uh, and this. Actually, uh, after this uh, three techniques, so those are cumulative. So after those three techniques, we can. Um, uh, almost always achieve the uh, yeah, almost always achieve the highest accuracy on the real quantum device. That means we can uh, uh, effectively reduce the impact of the quantum noise. So another interesting thing uh, is that we do some um, visualization of the features. So uh, basically here we can say uh, we can see that this is the uh, at least two classification two classification class. So um, because we only use two qubits. So that means we just have two features, right? So the x axis is the feature one, uh, feature dimension one, and the y axis is the feature dimension two. So uh, there are uh, three uh, different colors. For the yellow one, we have the baseline, like the, um, for the baseline, we can see, uh, no matter that's the digit uh, three or digit six, all of the values are, are squeezed like, in the middle. So that means um, there's, not a lot of uh, information contains because of the noise of the uh, quantum noise, right? So when we do the classification, uh, uh, the boundary of the classification is the in the, in the blue dash line here, and all of them will be classified. Uh, let's see, classified as uh, six. So in that case, fifty percent of the samples will be incorrect, right? So after applying this uh, post measurement normalization, we can see that the distribution is spread uh, a lot. So from this yellow to this. Uh, to the to the green right, the green uh green distribution so we can see the circles on the, on the top and some most of the uh the stars on the bottom so we can after the classification the error will be reduced and finally after this noise injection that's the most important part after noise injection the uh during the training we are, we are aware of the, the squeezing effect of the noise in the next case uh, even for the final result uh, with this noise injection uh, the practice can be aware of the noise. In that case, we further uh, extract this distribution to the top uh, left corner and the bottom right corner. So in that case, after we do this um, classification boundary, we can uh, still see a pretty uh, good classification accuracy. Some of them is in fact, but most of them is in the correct region. Right. Yeah. So any questions on this? Yeah, okay. So, um, so actually, uh, when we dis uh, discuss about the quantum device, you can see that we always, most of our experiments are performed on the IBM uh, quantum device. So that is uh, 
kind of device uh, uh, called a superconducting uh, superconducting device. So we also have some uh, other new technologies like the. Uh, for example, we also have the uh, type ion um, device, like the TI device, and this item device. So uh, the superconducting device is that uh, we we fabricate the qubits with the uh, the, the, the silicon-based uh, technology. So the advantage is that all the qubits uh, can be can be fabricated using the current uh, foundry because currently we are pretty familiar with how to uh, fabricate the silicon-based device, right? Uh, but the uh, the drawback is that every qubit you fabricate it is not identity because those are like uh, large device. It's not just a uh, say one item or uh, small things. So you cannot make sure every qubit is the same. So that will bring some inherent noise inside, right? And for the trap ion, the trap ion basically you just use some electromagnetic field to trap those uh, small uh, small ions in in a, in the uh, in the trap, and then you can control the location of them and also apply the lasers to them. So the advantage is that, is that the ion is actually um, identity, that is qubits fabricated by the mother nature, right? So in that case, we don't need to worry about the, the qubits quality, but the control of them can be pretty difficult because we have, uh, say we have to use lasers to control those qubits. So uh, imagine we have one million qubits, how, how to have like one million lasers? So that's extremely difficult because of the large uh, form factor of the, those laser generators. And also for the new item, uh, the new item is that um, the item is uh, not carrying any uh, carrying carry, carry the uh, electrodes. So in that case, we can just a needle uh, in the uh, in the in the in the, in the uh, vacuum chamber. So in that case, we can also control those items using the lasers. So uh, there are those are the three uh, like mainstream uh, technologies that we can use in all this. Um, so um, the reason why we are using IBM Q is that the IBM Q is the the, the, the earliest that uh, with open access. So some of other uh, machines, if you check out the AWS uh, Amazon Web Service, you can have access to. Uh, the you know, ion and the new item devices uh, as, as well as the uh, superconducting. So I think the uh, cloud computing platform is, uh, is uh, extremely useful for, especially for its emerging technologies. So previously, remember in the 1970s uh, for the Apple company, you have to fabricate a perfect product and sell that to, to the customers to make money, right? But right now, it's no need to, uh, to, do, that, to do that. You can fabricate a uh, quantum computer by yourself and then you just connect it back to the AWS and then other, other users will pay you by just playing with your device. So that's um, extremely useful to especially the emerging uh, quantum technologies here. Okay, so um, yeah, I think that's uh, uh, what we have, have already uh, introduced today is that uh, first of all, we introduced the uh, TQ usage, uh, especially uh, how can we use those basic operations to uh, uh, man manipulate the, the quantum states and also do the training on the GPUs. And then we introduce the quantum NAS framework uh, as, as well as several other frameworks using reinforcement learning, using the uh, differentiable uh, architecture search to, to find the best uh, noise robust uh, PQC architecture. So the key takeaway is that we can use the super circuit to uh, save the cost uh, of the training because we just need to train once but use for many times. And another thing is the robust uh, PQC parameter training. So we introduced the uh, noise injection. So basically, when you inject the quantum noise, the parameters uh, you train is more robust when you deploy on the real device. Okay, so uh, I think that's today's uh, lecture. And next class, uh, we will introduce, uh, we will have, have you to introduce the planning project results. Okay, so that's all today. Thank you very much.